Okay, so a couple things before we get started today. So uh, you might have noticed if you're keeping up with eCampus uh, that I posted the um, grades for the for test number three. Um, I can't hand back your tests yet because I still have some makeup exams to give. Um, I know there's, I think there's at least two who haven't taken up the, taken the makeup exams yet. Um, so if you're one of those people, uh, I'd appreciate it if you drop me an email and uh, we can get uh, a makeup exam scheduled. Um, I, I think you may have already emailed me, but I get so many emails lately that they get lost very easily. So um, if you could email me again, we need to set up the, uh, the makeup exams so that everybody can get their, um, their test back. Um, also, another thing, um, you may have noticed I completely forgot to post a quiz on Wednesday. And we're getting down to the end of the line here. And uh, you guys really need quizzes uh, so that you can maximize your quiz points by, uh, by, by getting as many dropped grades as we can fit in. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. So today when I get back to the office, I'm going to post a quiz on uh, what we covered on Wednesday. And I'll post another quiz on what we covered today. And I will give you guys some extra time because there's two quizzes. So um, the deadlines for both of the quizzes will be Sunday evening at 11.59. So you'll have, you'll have the entire weekend uh, to, to do those two quizzes. Um, and I'll have to try to find a way to fit some more in too, because um, if, unless I try to fit some more in, that only gives us 22 quizzes. And I want you guys to have more opportunities for grade drops. That, that, if we only fit in 22, that means only your two lowest quiz grades are dropped. I'd like to get that to at least four. So um, I'll, I'll figure out some way to, uh, to get some more quizzes in. Uh, question on uh, Zoom. Can you give us the details on the extra credit for the food donation tent and biology club? Yeah. Um, I'll post that on eCampus. I um, I keep forgetting. Uh, it's uh, you might hear this from a lot of your professors. We're we're we're, we're so swamped with stuff now because it's been such a crazy semester, semester with COVID that we we forget a lot of stuff because we just have a lot on our plates. Um, but yeah, I am participating in the biology club food drive. I am offering extra credits for participating. Um, there's a flyer uh, that one of the uh, biology club members gave me. Uh, I'll post it on eCampus. Uh, I really can't give you too many details because they're, again, they're doing things differently because of COVID. They're not doing it the way they have in the past. But um, yes, I am participating in that. And um, I'll have the flyer posted when I get, after I get back to the office today, when I'm putting together quizzes, I'll post that on eCampus as well. Um, and it's, of course, it's for a good cause. Um, and you can earn yourself some, some extra bonus points as well. Okay. Are there any other questions on anything for anybody on Zoom or in the class today? All right, so let's get back to uh, circulation. So we're gonna finish up circulation today and we'll start on immunity as well. So this is where we left off. So uh, we talked about the circulatory system, the cardiovascular system, uh, the heart, the blood vessels, uh, and now we're talking about blood itself. So we all know from uh, chapter, the tissues chapter, I think it's 42, uh, that blood is a specialized connective tissue. And just like all connective tissues, uh, we have a, a cellular portion and we have an extracellular matrix. The cellular portion of blood, uh, there's two types of cells that make up the cellular portion of blood. Uh, we have erythrocytes or red blood cells. Erythrocytes, uh, again, they have this very unusual shape called the biconcave disc. Uh, they're about six to eight micrometers in diameter, which is relatively small. Okay, so in comparison, about six micrometers is about the size of a nucleus on, on, a, on a regular uh, human cell. So these are rather small cells. And they have this very unusual biconcave disc shape. 
Um, they're packed full of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin gives them their red color. Of course, hemoglobin is important in transporting oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and also transporting carbon dioxide from the tissues back to the lungs where we can get rid of it. Um, red blood cells uh, have a lifespan of about three months. Uh, after about three months, they're, um, they're recycled. Um, and these make up most of the cells that we see in blood tissue. About 99% of blood cells are red blood cells. They also, the last thing we talked about on Wednesday, uh, there are carbohydrates on the surface of these red blood cells uh, that allow for ABO uh, blood typing. So, in other words, the carbohydrates on the surface uh, determine if your you know, blood type A, B, AB, or, or type O. And here's another uh, another picture. So in uh, generally between six and eight micrometers in diameter, um, and they have this very unusual biconcave disc shape. Uh, again, no nucleus in uh, in human red blood cells when they're mature. Uh, other species do have nucleated red blood cells, but not. We're, we're basically dealing with the human circulatory system for the rest of this PowerPoint. All right, so 99% of the blood cells are erythrocytes or red blood cells. The remaining 1% are white blood cells or leukocytes. Um, there's several different types of white blood cells and their functions are all related to immunity or the immune system. Just like the erythrocytes, all blood cells are produced by stem cells in the bone marrow. So remember there's, there's a, only a couple bones in the human body have red marrow. The red marrow is the type of marrow that makes red blood cells. Uh, the sternum and the ilium, which is your outside hip bone, uh, these have red marrow. And they uh, contain these special type of stem cells. They're called uh, pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells. You, you guys don't need to know that name. All you really need to know are, 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 just, are special stem cells. And all types of blood cells are made by these uh, pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells that we find in the red marrow of, of certain bones. Okay, so here, this is actually a very interesting picture. I've used this picture in other classes. Um, only 1% of the cells are white blood cells. And this is an unusual picture because looking at this picture, um, the white blood cells are really overrepresented. Uh, usually, if, if you're looking at, I'm, well, I know some of you have looked at blood slides uh, in the laboratory. And usually you don't see this many white blood cells together. Usually you see one here or there. Another interesting thing about this picture is we have a couple different types of white blood cells represented in the same picture. Okay? Now, you guys don't need to know the different types of white blood cells, okay? But um, I can just tell by looking at this. So uh, here and here, uh, these are a type of white blood cell called neutrophils. Um, this is a basophil, uh, this is an eosinophil, uh, this is a lymphocyte, and this is a monocyte. And over here we can even see this little, uh, this is actually a, a fragment of a white blood cell. Uh, these are called platelets, and they're involved in blood clotting. So this, this is kind of like a, a one in a million picture, to have all these different types of, of white blood cells in the same picture together. Um, Maybe it's fake, I don't know. Maybe they, they had to kind of cheat a little bit to get all these different white blood cells in the same picture. But again, very interesting picture. Okay, I talked about platelets. We could see one platelet in that last picture. Uh, platelet, platelets are fragments of cells. Uh, they're derived from large cells in the bone marrow called megakaryocytes. Okay. Now, uh, these megakaryocytes don't leave the bone marrow. Uh, but they're made from the same stem cells that make all the other uh, types of blood cells. Um, and uh, platelets are involved in blood clotting. Okay, so again, we can see a drawing of different cell types and we can see these little, now platelets aren't actually cells, they're just fragments of cells 
Uh, megakaryocytes sites are, are very large cells that reside in the bone marrow and these little tiny platelets kind of bud off of it. And then of course the platelets are involved in, in blood clotting. Yeah, I'll just give you guys a second. I see some of you still taking notes. Okay, so here's another picture. Uh, this is actually a, a, a scanning electron micrograph uh, that's been colorized. Um, now, electron microscopes can't see in color. This has been artificially colorized. Um, so you can see the red blood cells. Again, you can, you can uh, see the, the biconcave disc shape. Um, white blood cells, so I, in that picture that we looked at, the white blood cells were actually blue. However, they're, they're stained blue so that we can visualize them better. Of course, they're not actually blue in, uh, in our blood. And we can see some platelets. Of course, the platelets are cell fragments involved in clotting. Okay, so this just shows some of the different lineages of uh, blood cells. So, the stem cells are in uh, bone marrow, particularly in, in red bone marrow. And again, these are a special type of, ste of stem cell called a pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, you guys don't need to remember that name, but it's a, a special type. Um, so this type of stem cell gives rise to all of the types of blood cells. So it makes red blood cells. It makes the megakaryocytes, which make the platelets. And then it makes uh, eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils. These are just different types of white blood cells. You guys aren't going to have to know the different types of white blood cells for the test. Uh, it makes monocytes. Monocytes are, are immature macrophages. Uh, this is a mature macrophage. Um, we've talked about macrophages before. Uh, these are the types of cells that are constantly patrolling your tissues looking for anything out of the ordinary. Uh, these are phagocytic cells that can actually engulf and digest uh, any, uh, any sort of a pathogen that they find. Uh, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Uh, you might know these as uh, B cells and T cells. Uh, these are involved in uh, different types of, of, of uh, B lymphocytes specifically are involved in the, uh, the antibody or the, the humoral immune response. Uh, T lymphocytes are involved in more cell-based immune responses. Again, um, we'll talk about this more next chapter. But um, okay, that, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions on anything we covered today, as far as blood cells? Um, so the next chapter is the immune system, which really kind of segues nicely uh, because the immune system, of course, involves a lot of the types of blood cells we already talked about. Oh, I'm not sharing that. There, now I'm sharing. Now I'm sharing. Okay, so the immune system, this is the system that protects the body from disease-causing foreign invaders. Okay, and there's a certain term we use for disease-causing foreign invaders, and they're called pathogens. So we have several different types of pathogens. Um, pathogens can be bacteria. Now, not all bacteria are disease-causing. In fact, let me ask you guys a question, see if, if anybody can, can kind of guess this. What percentage of the bacteria that we know of do you think actually cause disease? Anybody want to take a guess on that? Uh, Jacob, uh, Chris is guessing 1%. 
that's pretty close. Okay, only about 2% of all the bacteria in the environment cause disease. Okay, um, the other 98% are actually very, very beneficial. Uh, so, but, but a small amount, about 2% uh, do cause disease. And here are some examples, uh, streptococcus. Uh, anybody know uh, an example of a disease caused by streptococci or streptococcus? Strep throat, yeah, strep throat the obvious one because the, you know, the name streptococcus is, is right there. Um, yeah, streptococcus, uh, strep throat, uh, trying to think of some of the other in infections that it causes. But uh, streptococci are, uh, of course, pathogenic. How about mycobacterium? Does anybody know um, of a disease caused by a mycobacterium? Let me give you some examples of mycobacteria that cause diseases and maybe that'll help your memory. So uh, mycobacterium leprae causes disease. Uh, mycobacterium legionella causes diseases. Anybody have any guesses? The last one's gonna give it away. Uh, the last one is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Of course that causes tuberculosis, right? Uh, Mycobacterium legionella causes Legionnaire's disease, which is uh, another respiratory disease uh, like tuberculosis. Uh, Mycobacterium leprae is the, the uh, bacteria that causes leprosy. Okay, fortunately, in, in today's day and age, we, we, that's a disease we don't see much anymore. Um, lastly, Yersinia. Does anybody know what Yersinia? Yersinia causes, well, it causes a very important very deadly disease. Uh, again, one that we don't hear of anymore. Particularly the bacterium Yersinia pestis. Has anybody heard of Yersinia pestis before? Okay. Uh, Yersinia pestis uh, caused the Black Plague. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, of course, back in the Middle Ages, this wiped out a significant portion of the human population. Um, we don't see it today, though, because Yersinia uh, pestis is actually very sensitive to antibiotics. So if, if they had only had penicillin back in the Middle Ages, then you know half of the human population, or how I don't know if it was half, but it's a large portion of the human population got wiped out by this plague. Um, you know, very simple antibiotics is all it took to stop it. Okay, so there's an example of uh, bacteria as pathogens. Okay, uh, pathogens can also be viruses. So uh, obviously we know this very well. We're, all of us in the class today are wearing masks because of a, of a pandemic caused by a virus, uh, the uh, coronavirus. Uh, of course, coronavirus, that's an example of a, uh, a viral pathogen. Uh, polio is another example of a disease caused by a pathogen. This is another one we don't see too much anymore. Uh, there's been some really, uh, most countries have vaccination programs where people are vaccinated at a young age. So we don't see polio anymore. Pox, smallpox, of course, uh, was another disease that killed lots of people in the past. Uh, we don't see it anymore because of vaccination. The, the very first vaccination that was invented was invented to uh, prevent smallpox. So we don't see that anymore. Chickenpox, we still see. Uh, of course, that's caused by a virus as well, but that's mostly a children's disease. Uh, influenza, of course, this comes around every year. Um, we uh, have vaccines against them, but they're only good for one year. Uh, rabies is also caused by a virus. HIV, of course, caused by the human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, fungi can also be pathogens. Uh, some examples of Fungal pathogens, we have trichophyton and candida. Um, fungal pathogens, very few of them cause like serious disease unless you're already immunocompromised. Uh, trichophyton, this is the type of disease that causes things like um, athlete's foot uh, and um, athlete's foot, you know, drop itch, that type of thing. Um, candida, Candida can be a little more serious. Uh, if you've ever been to uh, buildings where they have a black mold infestation, 
Uh, that's usually some sort of a, of a candida species. And these can get into your lungs and they can cause a, a serious respiratory disease. Okay. But again, fungi, another example of a pathogen. Right. Pathogens can also be protozoans. Uh, so what are protozoans? Protozoans, we're talking about uh, protistins, uh, much like the, the, uh, the protistins that we looked at in lab. So in lab, we looked at some uh, paramecium, amoebas. Okay, these are examples of protozoans. Uh, of course, the ones that we look at in lab don't cause disease. Some do cause disease. Uh, examples of protozoans that cause disease, we have uh, plasmodium and we have uh, trypanosomes. Um, plasmodium actually causes a very serious tropical disease, uh, particularly a, uh, a protozoan called uh, plasmodium falciparum. Has anybody, has anybody heard that before? Plasmodium falciparum? Or know what, uh, does anybody know what disease that causes? Let me give you a hint. So um, this protozoan actually infects people through an insect vector, particularly a mosquito. So these protozoans live in mosquitoes and malaria, malaria exactly. And the malaria is uh, an extremely important tropical disease right? and the scary thing about malaria too is as uh, global warming continues uh, it seems like it's mostly a tropical disease but it seems to be moving farther and farther north as as the climate suffers from global warming yeah so plasmodium uh, again very uh, a very notable uh, tropical disease that causes malaria uh, trypanosomes as well uh, Trypanosomes are also spread by an insect vector. They're spread by uh, the, the tsetse fly in Africa. And uh, these cause what's called African sleeping sickness, um, which again is a, a very, uh, very debilitating disease. Um, pathogens can be worms as well. So for example, flatworms or roundworms. Now, I'm not talking about the same flatworms that we've been using as an example in class. Uh, those are planarians. So when I gave you an example of like a gastrovascular cavity or an incomplete uh, digestive system, I, I used uh, a flatworm as an example. Those are planarians, those are different. Those don't cause disease. Um, other types of flatworms like uh, liver flukes, for example, um, do cause disease. L liver flutes are exactly what they sound like. They're, they're flatworms that actually uh, live inside of your liver. Um, roundworms, so roundworms, uh, a good example of a roundworm infestation is a hookworm. Um, hookworms, especially around here, hookworm used to be a big problem. Um, you know, back before there was a, a indoor plumbing and people were you know, and of course, West Virginia is a very rural state, so there were a lot of places that didn't have indoor plumbing, you know, until maybe 80, 100 years ago. Um, when people walk barefoot, uh, like uh, around a cesspit or an outhouse, uh, through the soles of their feet, they could get a, a hookworm. Okay, and what hookworm does is that they're kind of, once they infect your tissue, they're not very particular. They just kind of crash around and, uh, and destroy tissue. Um, that used to be a problem, uh, you know, particularly in this area. But again, roundworm is something we don't see much anymore. Good, and which is very good. Another type. So this is a very unusual type of uh, pathogen. This last one, prions. Uh, prions are infectious proteins. Um, a good example of this that you all are probably too young to remember now, but about oh, I'd say about twenty years ago. Um, mad cow disease was a big problem in Great Britain. Um, and it's spread by infectious proteins. And what, what happens is um, a prion is basically an improperly folded protein. And when it encounters other proteins of the same type, it folds those other proteins into the wrong shape. And uh, these proteins are found in neural tissue. And what happens is these misfolded proteins form plaques 
in the brain. And this leads to a neurodegenerative disease. Now, uh, in Great Britain, they noticed that, that some cows were losing their coordination and falling over. Um, at the time, they didn't know there were, it was mad cow disease that was doing this. Uh, mad cow disease is also known as a bovine spongiform encephalopathy. But what they did, you know, wanting to make money off their cows, when, when a cow died like that, they ground up the dead cow and they put it in the feed for the other cows. Now, when they did that, those proteins in the cow's brain uh, were consumed by the other cows and that spread the mad cow disease. So now more animals were getting it. So before they figured out that they were infecting their own animals by, uh, by grinding up the dead animals, putting them back in the feed, this thing had spread a lot, okay? So we see this in cows. Uh, we also see this in uh, sheep. Uh, there's a form of this called scrapie. Uh, there's a form in humans too. Um, genetically, when we get it, it's called creutzfeldt jakob disease. Um, there's also a form called Kuru that spread among people in Papua New Guinea. Uh, this, this is kind of gross, but uh, in Papua New Guinea, when people die, they practice ritual cannibalism. So basically, they were spreading Kuru the same way that the, the Brits were spreading mad cow disease by feeding the cow. When they would ritually consume the dead, that would spread the prions to other people and then of course that would lead to a neurodegenerative disease, okay? So just some examples, you don't need to know all these examples I talked about, just that, uh, you know, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoans, worms, prions, all these other things I was talking about were, were just examples. Um, I probably went on too long. I, when I did my PhD, I was in an infectious diseases lab, so this is kind of like my thing, so that's why I, I went off on, uh, on this for probably too long. Okay, so let's talk about the immune system now. Uh, immune systems consist of three levels of detection, uh, physical, chemical, and cellular. Okay, three levels of detection, physical, chemical, and cellular. So first, let's look at physical defenses. Physical defenses include surface barriers and filters. So skin epithelial layers, um, these provide barriers. So our, our skin and the epithelial lining of our uh, our respiratory tract, our digestive tract, all of these things help to keep pathogens out. Okay, by, by just simply by acting as a, as a physical barrier to passage. Uh, we also have um, nasal hair, uh, epithelial, so nasal hair of course acts as a filter uh, to mechanically filter out things that we breathe in. So it's gonna keep out you know, debris like dust, uh, but also things like mold spores, uh, bacteria, pollen, okay, stuff that, that's carried. Uh, so these are all physical barriers that help to keep pathogens and other things like dust and mold spores out. Well, no, mold spores can be pathogens. Uh, pollen. Uh, then we have mechanical responses. Uh, mechanical responses, we have cilia, uh, we have blinking, sneezing, coughing, vomiting. Um, so if you guys think back to, um, what chapter was it? Um, the tissues chapter, I guess. Um, we saw how some uh, columnar epithelia are ciliated on the apical surface. And uh, I gave you the example of the mucociliary escalator. So. Uh, the beating of those cilia helps to move debris-laden mucus along your trachea so that we can get rid of it. Okay, so that's an example of a mechanical response. It's mechanically help 
the cilia are mechanically cleaning your, your trachea. Um, so blinking, sneezing, so if you get anything in your eye, you'll, you'll, you'll tear up, you'll blink. That helps to uh, make some tears and wash away any pathogens that got in your eye. Uh, sneezing, again, sneezes can be quite powerful, so uh, any pathogens that are irritating you can be expelled by sneezing. Same thing with coughing, uh, same thing with vomiting. So vomiting can help to get rid of, of pathogens that have gotten into your digestive tract. Um, another physical defense, uh, high temperature or fever. Okay, now a lot of people think a fever is going to, you know, just by raising the temperature, it's going to kill off the pathogens. Um, but that's not actually how it works. As you can imagine, if, if the fever got hot enough to kill living things, it's going to kill your cells too. So let me see if anybody can figure it out. So, so why do you think we get a fever when we're sick if a fever isn't actually going to be enough to kill off bacteria or, or viruses? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Okay, let me give you a hint and see if you can figure it out. So now when you're sick, your immune system is going to start battling the pathogens, right? And this is, there's going to be a series of chemical reactions that are going to be important in getting rid of this, uh, this, this pathogenic invasion of your body. Um, what happens to chemical reactions when we raise the temperature on? They speed up, okay? So that, that's the whole point of a fever. You know, if, if anybody tells you that your, your fever is going to get hot enough to kill bacteria, that's not what happens. The, the high temperatures just speed up the chemical reactions involved in, in killing off these bacteria. So it's going to make things go faster. All right. Then we have competition, uh, harmless bacteria. So um, like I mentioned at the very beginning of today's lecture, only about 2% of the bacteria that we find in the environment are pathogenic and uh, gonna cause disease. Most of them are actually very beneficial. Um, and some of them live on you all the time. So your, your skin is colonized by bacteria. There's, uh, uh, you'll find uh, uh, Streptococcus epidermidis. Okay, that's uh, a harmless bacteria that lives on your skin. Um, in your digestive tract, uh, there's a lot, lots of uh, bacteria that not only are harmless, are actually very, very beneficial uh, that live in your digestive tract. Okay. So by occupying the spaces on your skin where bacteria can live, uh, they're denying a place for pathogenic bacteria to live. Okay, so um, that's, that's the way that the bacteria on your skin help you. Okay, same thing with your digestive tract. Um, because your digestive tract is colonized with harmless bacteria, uh, actually better than harmless, most of them are, are helpful bacteria, um, that means there's no room for pathogenic bacteria to occupy that space because it's already taken up by harmless bacteria. Okay, so competition for living space uh, is uh, another way that these harmless bacteria uh, help to prevent uh, but they act as a physical defense by physically occupying those spaces. Okay, we have chemical defenses as well. Uh, chemical defenses, high salt. So our sweat is actually full of electrolytes uh, like sodium chloride. And most microorganisms don't like to grow in uh, a high salt environment. Okay, so this is one chemical defense we can use uh, to eliminate pathogens. Also acid. So if we look at our sweat and uh, the oil that's secreted from our skin, um, it has fatty acids in it. Okay, and these, these fatty acids have uh, antimicrobial properties that can help to kill off bacteria. Uh, also uh, hydrochloric acid and gastric fluid so remember that your stomach is a very uh, low pH environment. It has a pH of about 2.0. Uh, 
Um, and this acts as a chemical barrier to infection by pathogens. So anything that you consume, let's say you ate something that's been hanging out a little too long, uh, something that could cause, cause food poisoning. Well, the pathogens in that food need to pass through your stomach before they get to your small intestine. And they have to survive the low pH environment of your stomach. So the, the, the low pH environment of your stomach actually acts as a chemical defense uh, against infection. Uh, adhesives, uh, mucin and mucus. So again, I've talked about there's uh, special cells in the, the stomach, in the intestines, in your trachea called goblet cells that secrete mucus. Um, mucus is sticky. So it can stick to pathogens like bacteria, like, uh, like viruses. Um, and then of course, like the mucociliary escalator can get rid of that debris laden mucus. So we can get rid of pathogens that way. Um, earwax, so uh, earwax is another example of a natural defense. Of course, earwax is very sticky. Anything that's not supposed to be in there, uh, pathogen, so certain pathogenic bacteria can cause middle ear infections. Um, if it sticks to the earwax, and so the earwax kind of naturally comes out after a while, um, that can help to prevent infections. Uh, then we have antibacterial enzymes as well. Uh, lysozyme and sweat, tears, saliva, and mucus. Um, lysozyme is an enzyme that breaks down the cell walls of bacteria. And once the cell wall of bacteria is broken down, that compromises the bacterium and uh, it, it's going to die. Uh, so this, this enzyme, we find it in sweat, we find this enzyme in tears, uh, in saliva, uh, and in the mucus that can trap pathogens also. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about cellular defenses. And we can divide cellular defenses uh, into two parts. We have natural immunity and acquired immunity. Natural immunity is innate, rapid, uh, limited in specificity, uh, has no memory and is non-adaptive. So natural immunity is really just your first line of defense against pathogens uh, until your acquired immunity can kick in. And once your acquired immunity kicks in, uh, acquired immunity is, is much more effective. Some examples of natural immunity. Uh, first is phagocytosis. So uh, if you can think back to Oh, when did we cover phagocytosis? I remember I showed you that one animation with a mouse macrophage and a mold spore where the mouse macrophage consumed the mold spore. Uh, that's an example of phagocytosis. So uh, there's a couple types of cells, white blood cells that we find in blood that are capable of doing phagocytosis, okay? Uh, macrophages are one, uh, neutrophils are another. You, you guys don't need to, to know this exactly. But what they do is basically these cells kind of go around looking for anything out of the ordinary. Uh, when they see something out of the ordinary, they engulf them and then they digest them. Okay. Uh, bulk, it was when we were talking about bulk transport that I, I talked about phagocytosis before. So that's when the cell engulfs it and basically eats the pathogen. That's one example of natural immunity. Uh, another example of natural immunity is something called complement. Uh, complement is very complex. Complement is made up of about 20 different proteins. And um, complement, I remember way back when I was an undergraduate, uh, they used to describe complement to me as uh, kind of like a Swiss army knife. If you've ever seen a Swiss Army knife, there's a, a lot of different things you can do. You can, you know, you got a, you got a knife, you got scissors, you've got a toothpick, you've got a corkscrew, you've got all these different things, right? Complement is kind of like, like a Swiss Army knife of the uh, immune system. It can do some, some different things. Um, it can bind to the surface of bacteria and uh, some viruses, envelope viruses. 
uh, and just poke holes in it until that virus or that bacterium dies. Um, it can act as a signal. So when, when, when complement binds to the surface of bacteria, it can act as a signal for a macrophage or a neutrophil to come eat it. Okay, so that's, not, that, that's called, uh, that's actually called, um, geez, I'm gonna draw a blank on this. Um, Wow, how did I drop a complete blank on that? Wow, <laughs> must have been a long day already. How can I, how do we? <laughs> we'll, we'll see later. Uh, this is stuff that I've been studying for like 20 years and I still, <laughs> I still forget it every now and then. <laughs> okay. Um, so it can, it can also act as a uh, basically a, an, an eating signal is what it is. So when it, when, when it binds to the surface of bacteria, then macrophages will come and it, it will enhance uh, phagocytosis. Um, okay, so that's complement. So, so again, complement is a, a, a component of the natural immune system. Uh, again, non-adaptive, no memory, but this acts as a good first line of defense against pathogens. Um, then we have acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is slow, highly specific, has memory, and is adaptive. And we can break down acquired immunity into two parts. Uh, humoral immunity. Uh, humoral immunity uh, involves antibodies. So this is also kind of known, sometimes known as an antibody response. Oh, I knew it was going to do that. Okay, so humoral immunity, it's not going to let me draw with the mouse, but humoral, humoral immunity is an antibody response. Uh, cellular immunity, uh, this is where, uh, this involves special types of cells called uh, killer T cells that are going to kill off uh, cells that are infected by, by viruses or other intracellular pathogens. Okay, uh, phagocytosis, which I just talked about. Uh, this is engulfing, killing, and digestion of whole cells or particles by other cells. Um, again, like I mentioned before, uh, there's two types of phagocytic cells. Uh, neutrophils. Uh, neutrophils are the most abundant type of white blood cells. So when we were looking at that picture of white blood cells before, notice I, I pointed out two neutrophils and then one of each other type, each of the other types. Uh, neutrophils are, are very common and they, they, they can engulf and digest uh, pathogens. Uh, macrophages, macrophages are also white blood cells uh, that engulf and digest pathogens. However, macrophages are found, mature macrophages are just found in the tissues of your body. So we, we wouldn't find mature macrophages in the blood. Okay, that, that's where we find neutrophils. All right, I'm just going to give the people who are still taking notes a second, and I'll have a sip of coffee while you're doing that. Okay, so again, uh, two types of phagocytic cells, and, and by phagocytic cells, I just mean cells capable of doing phagocytosis. Uh, neutrophils, which we found, we find in peripheral blood in, in the in the blood vessels. Uh, macrophages we find in the tissues. And here's that animation that I told you about before. So we've seen this before when we talked about bulk transport. So this big cell in the upper left is a macrophage from a mouse. And this little thing that it identified as foreign is a mold spore. And what we're looking at is phagocytosis. 
So phagocytosis is engulfing the mold spore. Um, once this mold spore has been engulfed, uh, it's going to be digested. So if you think way back, I think chapter, not chapter three, chapter four, when we talk about organelles, uh, lysosomes, remember, are organelles involved in digestion. So um, the phagosome or the vesicle that this mold spore is uh, in, that'll fuse with a lysosome and the digestive enzymes in the lysosome will digest this mold spore. Okay, so another thing that cells that are phagocytic do uh, is once they identify something as foreign and they digest it, they become activated. Right? When they're activated, they start secreting different types of chemicals. Uh, one type of chemical secreted by an activated macrophage uh, are chemotaxins. Uh, chemotaxins are chemicals that attract other white blood cells. So basically this is just like, uh, like a little cry for help, right? Uh, the other white blood cells will follow the trail of the chemotaxins uh, to where the macrophage is. Um, this is so that the other white blood cells uh, can, be, can be recruited to the site of an infection uh, to help the activated macrophage to, uh, to battle the infection. Uh, another type of chemical that's released by activated macrophages are uh, prostaglandins. Uh, prostaglandins in, uh, induce inflammation. Uh, so an inflammatory response, um, basically inflammatory responses are, are what make you feel sick when you get infection. Um, so this is going to induce inflammation. Uh, it's also going to induce like redness. Um, I'm sure everybody's uh, experienced this before. So whenever you get a, an inflammatory response, uh, you're going to swell up a little bit. Okay. The, the, uh, the swelling comes from the increased capillary leakiness. So your capillaries are going to become a little leakier. That's going to allow uh, fluid to leak into the surrounding tissue. And that, that's what makes you swell up a little bit, okay? Also, you're gonna notice you're a little bit warm and red, okay? That's also due to these chemicals that are being secreted by the activated macrophages. White blood cells and serum leak into the tissues. So the, the reason for the leaky capillaries is because uh, neutrophils in your bloodstream need to get out of those capillaries and into the tissue where the infection is so that they can combat it. So um, the leaky capillaries allow the, the white blood cells out so they can get into the, the tissues where the infection is. But this also means we're gonna get fluid leaking into the tissue and that's gonna cause uh, edema. Another word for edema is, is swelling. All right, another chemical that's secreted by an activated macrophage is endogenous pyrogen. This is going to induce fever and drowsiness. So again, uh, the, the redness and the hotness that we get is, uh, is caused by these chemicals. Uh, fever, of course, this is gonna raise the temperature so that your immune system can better fight against these pathogens because the chemical reaction is gonna happen faster. Drowsiness means you, you're going to need to uh, reserve your energy. So your your immune system needs your body's energy to fight the pathogen. So you become drowsy so that you can conserve energy and allow your body to fight off the infection. Uh, lactoferrin, another thing uh, released by an activated macrophage. This is a bactericidal protein. So this is going to help kill the, bacter uh, the bacterial in uh, a bacterial infection. Uh, cytokines, uh, one type of cytokine is interleukin. Uh, these enhance the function of other white blood cells. Um, so communication between cells of the immune system is, is very complicated. And cytokines are a, a class of hormone, basically, 
um, that's unique to the immune system. So these, these help the, uh, the cells of the immune system communicate with each other and coordinate the, uh, the immune response. Okay. And finally, um, activated macrophages uh, release growth factors. Uh, these promote growth and repair of damaged tissues. So um, during an infection, of course, we can get damage to tissues, so that needs to be repaired. And uh, these growth factors are gonna help affect that repair. All right, and I am out of time. So let me just quickly remind you of the announcements. Um, tests are graded, um, but you won't get them back until I finish giving makeups. So uh, those of you who need makeups, please contact me again. Um, let's get these taken care of ASAP. Um, secondly, quizzes. So I'm gonna double up on the quizzes and give you to give you the whole weekend to, to take the quizzes. Um, third, uh, Biology Club Food Drive. Um, when I'm back at the office this afternoon, I will post that flyer. And if you want to participate, you can get some extra credit points. Okay? And uh, I don't see any questions. I'm a little over time, so I'm just going to stop the meeting here. And I'll see you guys Monday morning. Um, you know what you got on the test, right? Um, you know what you got on the test? actually rather good. Um, let me just pull it up over here.